Okay, we are going through a series on the life of King David. Man, I've never been so colorful here up front, right? Wow, wow, wow. Okay. And now we are coming to chapters 11 and 12, and I don't, today don't have the TV. I couldn't get that thing working for some reason. So we're just going to use the big screens on the wall. And we are going to go to Samuel, 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And this is, this, this is a section in which we come to this rather sad and unsavory story of David and Bathsheba. We know the story, right? Very well known to all of us. David commits adultery and then tries to cover it up. And things get very bad, very complicated. And you know, King David was a king, yes, but he also was very much a man of flesh and blood. He was a study in contrasts. He was a man after God's heart on the one hand, but on the other hand, he was capable of great sin. I think it's very interesting that the Bible doesn't cover up the sins of its heroes. Sometimes you look at other literature, and the heroes are perfect, basically, right? But the Bible does point things out as they really are. And it's not in order to make our imaginations uh, vividly thinking about what they're doing, but it's that we would learn and see our own weaknesses and look for ways to be better people that would please God. I think a great focus of this study would be to take Galatians 2, uh, 6, 1, and focus on it. It says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. All right? Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And so when we, t- we uh, examine David's actions, we don't want to be here clucking our tongues. Right? But rather, we want to realize that we also have weak, a weakness to temptation and that we should humbly learn from David's example. So, we're asking a question today that I think is really important for all of us. The question is, what can we learn from David's struggle with temptation? And folks, we're all facing temptation, right? And so, what can I, what can I learn that can make me more or prepare me better to be able to face temptation? I'm going to give you... Some answers, I hope, this morning. Number one, you know, we all get into a fix. You know what a fix is? A fix in English means a difficult or awkward situation that it's really hard to get out of, kind of like a predicament, okay? So, you know, we're going to learn from David how we actually get into our different fixes, all right, for different predicaments and why it's so difficult to get out of them, looking at his example, right? Now, We often get caught up in messes of our own making. We sin against God. We sin against others. But you know, when you look back on these situations, they don't just happen. Usually they're a part of a pattern of behavior. This was true for David as well. A certain pattern of behavior that sets us up for failure. You know, (laughs) David wasn't just diligently being king, right? And boom, temptation hit. And he fell. No, come on, right? He was living a certain life. He had a certain attitude that set him up for failure. The same is true for you and me. And so being aware of the things that made him fall into temptation can keep us from doing the same thing, right? From falling into a fix that can destroy our lives in one way or other. So let's look at David, okay? The things that set him up for failure. First of all, we see that David was negligent in his duties. Negligent in his duties. When David fell into sin with Bathsheba, he was not where he should be, and he was not doing what he should be doing, okay? So he's wrong in the where and in the what. Notice this verse here. It says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Now, as the leader of the nation, David had always gone out with the troops, right? He needed to inspire them and guide them to victory. But for some reason, he decided to stay home. He was really being negligent with his duties. 
He was not doing what God had called him to do with his responsibilities. And this also implies that David wasn't really walking very close to God, okay? In fact, when you fall into temptation, usually it's because there's been a long period before that in which you have been being farther, becoming farther and farther away from God. And that's no doubt David's situation as well, right? So, so David was neglecting his calling, and in this way he was setting himself up for failure, which happens very soon. The same is true for you and me. We can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing, and we get into lots of trouble, right? You know, God has a, a purpose for your life. He really does. I have a good friend in Mexico City, where I'm from, and he told me the other day, he says, God is showing me. He's about my age, so think of this. And he says, God is showing me the purpose for my life. And I thought, well, it's about time, right? <laughs> but anyway, it's great to know that he's excited. He's excited. It'll give the rest of his life Make it very different. Well, God has a purpose for your life. You're here, first of all, to become like Jesus, right? But that you might serve him effectively in the areas that he has for you. And you know, when you take your eyes off your purpose in life, then you and the lure, the attraction of the world gets what? Bigger, right? And so, all of a sudden, we start seeing a lot of other purposes that look really interesting. And they start drawing us away drawing us away from God's actual plan for our lives, and that's what happens with David, okay? So David was negligent in his duties, in his purpose, and that set him up for failure. But another thing that set him up for failure is that he was overconfident. David was overconfident. I think it's important to notice that this all takes place at the pinnacle of David's career, okay? David was, uh, he was a hero, a national hero, he was powerful. He was rich. He enjoyed great military victories. And I believe that all of this made him overconfident and even presumptuous. He was self-satisfied with his achievements. We see that there was a heart of pride because he wasn't really walking close to God because he breaks God's commandments. Can you break God's commandments if you're walking very close with God? I don't think so, right? So he was, had a heart of, of pride. Boy, look at all I've done and what a great person I am. We read that the sin with Bathsheba began one late afternoon when David was walking on the roof of the king's house. This reminds him of another king who was also walking on the roof of his house. Have any idea who that was? Probably not. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of what? Well, you're not supposed to say it, right? Babylon. Babylon, okay? And we read about him, the following words, it says, at the, end of, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon which I built with my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Hmm. Well, this preceded a time of defeat and humiliation, which would come soon, right? He was puffed up with pride. And I think the same thing was true in the life of King David. Having had great success and power, he was puffed up. And that is always dangerous for all of us. When we have great success, folks, when everything's going so well, we can easily also start to believe our own stuff or to strut our stuff, as they say. And that can lead us to fall. Look at this verse here. Oh, no, pardon me. Nope. Yeah, I didn't. I wrote it here. Didn't write. Put it on the, on the screen. But you may know it in Proverbs 16, 18. It says, and this is what David should have kept in mind, okay? It says, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Okay? And that's what happens to David. He's thinking, I'm the greatest king, you know, just like Nebuchadnezzar, perhaps, and he falls. Had David remained humble, allowing God to control his life, he never would have committed the sin that he committed. And you know, we're tempted very often as well, aren't we? to be overconfident. When we don't walk close to God, yeah, we think that success is due to our efforts in some way or other. And so we start taking credit for what God is actually doing in our lives. Listen to this verse here. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Let me read another, another version. It makes it even clearer. This is the Today's Living Bible now. What are you so puffed up about? 
What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you are so great and as though you have accomplished something on your own? In other words, folks, everything I do, can I preach? Well, somewhat. But even that's a gift of God, right? Everything's a gift of God. And God wants us to be humble and to be grateful and not to start thinking, wow, I am really something, right? Believing our own stuff, as they say. And that was what caused David to fall. Another thing, another problem with David was that he was self-indulgent. What does that mean? That means that he was pleasure-seeking. He was pleasure-seeking. David gave free reign to his lusts. In fact, when he was supposed to be disciplining his life, and actually there's never a time when we shouldn't discipline our life, yeah, he was kind of letting his flesh go wild, right? And so what does he do? Well, he thinks he has the right to remain at home, and to, it looks like he slept all day on the couch, and in the evening, you know, he got up and walked around his roof, right? And then we see this following verse here. It says, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. I mean, the guy's really busy, right? Doing a great job as king. So he got, finally, finally got the courage to get up from his couch. Oh, life is rough, right? <laughs> and so he gets up from his couch, and he was walking on the roof of the king's house. Then he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and David sent and inquired about the woman. Well, David was being very lax, okay? Just trying to enjoy himself. He wasn't really working for God as God would have him do. I remember meeting one man in another country, and he had been a pastor for many years. I said, well, what, are you, what are you doing now? He said, well, you know, I've served God so many years. Now I have a right just to take it easy. So I go to church, but I don't do anything. Good for you. You deserve to do nothing. You think that's true? Folks, I think we're always, we never can retire from God's work, right? We always need to be careful and focused in our lives and never pleasure-seeking, always looking for God's will. Well, when we fall into, we've already seen this, when we fall into sin, it doesn't just happen, right? In fact, there's a song that I knew, I don't know if you know what it's called, it says, the chimes of time bring out the news, another day is through, someone slipped and fell, was that someone you? Gives the impression that we're walking down and boom, we slip and fall, right? But it never happens just that way, or extremely seldom does it happen that way. But rather, it's, it happens like we see in James. James chapter 1, it says the following. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Here you see a process a downward spiral, right? Downward process. We see there's desire, there's temptation, there's sin, and then it ends in destruction. That's what we see in David, just very clearly. This is the process he went through. His desires were activated through his sight, and he failed to control them. The desire gave birth to sin in his imagination, and this then led to sin, and the result of his action was Death, destruction, nothing good, everything lost, really. And you know something? The flesh, our flesh is the same today. We saw that last week. It never changes. In fact, that's why we're told in Scripture, it says, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its lusts. I have another couple of translations of this verse here. The Philip's translation says, give no chances to the flesh to have its fling. Interesting. The voice translation says, Do not fuel your sinful imagination by indulging your self-seeking desire for the pleasures of the flesh. In other words, don't nourish the flesh by indulging it. Flee from it. Get away from it. Keep it under discipline, under control, and we can do that. How many have a cell phone here today? Could you hold up a cell phone? Anybody have a cell phone? Don't feel guilty. Okay, I know you have them, so don't. Okay, I forgot mine. That's why I have to ask you. Right? I'm supposed to. I was, <laughs> I was going to use it as an example. See the cell phone, but I forgot it. Okay. Anyway, you know the cell phone is a great thing, right? But it's also full of temptations. Isn't that right? 
And I'm, you know, it doesn't have to be pornography. That's, that's, of course, accessible and all that. But it could be things like gaming. I mean, the other day I talked with a young man. I mean, young. He's about, about 17 years old and not from this church. And he said, yes, I, please pray for me. He says, I am really addicted to my phone. He just lives on his phone, you know. I mean, just a moment. You know, huh? wait, wait. He just can't get away. And there's so many things in that phone that aren't necessarily bad, but they do leave, lead to a type of bondage. And, of course, there are a lot of bad things in the phone, too, as well. And so, you know, you, you, you can neglect your calling by spending so much time on your cell phone, being stuck to your cell phone. It, it, you, it goes, and we're all looking right at it. Or I'm talking with somebody, and they, their phone rings, and it's, it's as, if, as if they were not talking to me. You know, here we are in a deep conversation, maybe in... in in counseling and drink. I said, come on, right? <laughs> but you know, we can be so into these things that ultimately lead us away from God. We can be indulging the flesh in a certain way while we're doing it with our cell phones. And that's just one example of ways in which we can give ourselves to something that should not be controlling us. Look at this verse here in Romans. It says, if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, for example, you present yourself to your cell phone as an obedient slave, ring, whoop, what does it say, right? You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. When we're not realistic about temptation, we give ourselves to pleasure internet, and so forth, right? We become self-indulgent. And that's really does, that really doesn't set us up for good. It sets us up for wrong things. And so we see this in David. He was negligent in his duties, self-indulgent, and then overconfident. And all of this led him to his sin, okay? You see this process. So that's, this is how David got into his fix, right? Into his predicament. This is how you and I get into our predicament. These same things. Negligence, overconfidence, indulgence. And then we wonder why we're stuck in this sin, folks. We don't, but okay, we don't want to stay here, right? We want to move ahead. So the second part of our um, sermon this morning is hopeful. It's how we can get ourselves out of a fix. And again, we're going to see David's example here. There's two ways to try to get out of our fix. First of all, there's the wrong way. Okay? How many want the wrong way? <laughs> yeah. You know, unfortunately, David's strategy for getting out of his fix was completely wrong. Okay? He begins totally wrong. What does he try to do? Well, you probably know the story, right? Bathsheba gets pregnant, and she sends a little message to, to David. <laughs> I'm pregnant. At that moment, his world starts spinning, right? Wow, out of control. And what does he do? Well, he brings back her husband from the battlefield, sends him home. Hopefully then, you know, they'll sleep together and then they'll kill that. will cover up any, any sin, apparent sin. Well, Uriah was so loyal to David, he refused to go home. So he stayed at the, at the palace. And you know the story, right? Eventually, he sends Uriah back to the battlefield and tells Joab to put him in a place where they would be sure to kill him. So really, David becomes his murderer. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Some of you may think, well, David, what a scoundrel. I could never be like that. But do we think we're any better than David, really, deep down? You know, in our flesh, dear people, we are capable of doing anything. It just depends on the circumstances. If you live in the flesh, you know, I had a pretty good upbringing, so I've not been tempted with many things that people who have a terrible upbringing have been tempted with, right? Was that because I'm something special? No, I had the fortune or the blessing, whatever, of having a good upbringing. Not without problems, right? But I was a wonderful kid, <laughs> right? But anyway, um, my flesh is terrible. The flesh is that leftover part of you from your old life before Christ, okay? It never dies. It's always able to activate itself and cause problems. So your flesh is no better than any, any, anybody else's flesh, and we're all capable of terrible things. And that's why it says here in this very important verse, it says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed 
that he not fall. In other words, if you think you're so great and so firm and so strong, watch out. Watch out because you're going to slip like on a banana peel and fall, right? Be careful. Unless we walk in the fear of the Lord, we'll also try to handle our sins just like David did or we'll try to get out of our fixes in the wrong way. Now, fortunately, God doesn't leave David in this situation, this horrible position of having done all these horrible things. And God doesn't leave you in your terrible situation when you do things that are wrong. He sends the prophet Dave, uh, Nathan to confront David. Now, this is interesting. Nathan's a great prophet, but he's going to tell David, the, most, the, the, the strong and mightiest person in the, in, in the kingdom, that he's wrong. Have you ever gone to tell somebody they're wrong? I had to do it quite a bit. My wife's had to do it a lot with me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we go trembling right and, oh boy, I want to tell you. <laughs> You're wrong. But, but he, here goes Nathan, okay, and he faces David. Now, David had just demonstrated that he could kill an innocent man, Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. But here goes, here goes Nathan, right? He wants to do his right. He wants to speak the truth and love. He wants to make things right for God's glory. So he goes and confronts David. Would you have confronted David? Good question, right? Let's see what Nathan does. Now, he's pretty smart. He uses a story to set a trap, so to speak, for, um, for David. Let's read it. <clears throat> and the Lord said, sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Wow. Then David's anger was, rightly so, greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Notice now. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Ba 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 bum. You know, we all need a David, a Nathan in our lives. Someone who has permission to speak truth into your life. Of course, in love, but even when it hurts. Most of us protect ourselves from Nathans, right? We don't, want it, we don't want to hear anything wrong. And we destroy our lives. We never progress. And we're so dissatisfied in our Christian lives. I know so many unhappy Christians. It's oh, great to serve Jesus. Amen. You know? And we need a Nathan to come along and say, hey, this is where you're wrong. This is why you're not happy. This is what you're doing incorrectly. Now, maybe your spouse can be that person that's more difficult. Because they have to do it at the right time with the right tone, <laughs> right? In the right way. And folks, it isn't easy in a marriage to do that, but it's not impossible. Almost, but it's not impossible. But whatever, you need, <laughs> you need, well, my wife's pretty wise with me. You know, she just takes the rolling pin out and goes at it and does a good job. But um, we need to be, yeah, open to somebody, okay, that can come and speak to our lives in a very real, direct way. You know, without confrontation, often we will not come to repentance. This is God's plan that we be confronted. You've read that in the Bible, that we are to confront one another, exhort one another, and so forth and so on. Otherwise, we pursue the wrong path, okay? But folks, hope for all, there is a right way to get ourselves out of a fix, okay, the right way. You've been waiting for this all, all, all afternoon, right? Okay, here it comes. Now, obviously, David's actions are shocking. 
Did you know that he broke two commandments in this whole thing with Bathsheba and Uriah? Two commandments that in the Mosaic law call for death, adultery, and murder. This is what David deserved, and yet God was gracious to him. And from the context, it's clear that David humbled himself. Despite the horrendous sins that he had committed, he knew that God was pursuing him to forgive and restore him. I think that God shows us David's filthy laundry because he wants us to realize that we too are capable of, of, of such sin. But no matter how great the sin, God is, will be there to pursue us, to call us back to himself, and to restore us. And you know, realizing how gracious God is is the first step toward getting out of the fix that we've fallen into, right? Getting out of our predicament, understanding that God is gracious. Now, I'm not saying... Listen to me well. I'm not saying that sin doesn't matter, that it's no big deal, okay? I'm not saying that. It's a big deal. In fact, David's sin would, would someday be part of the reason, one of the reasons why Jesus had to go to the cross. That's how serious his sin was. But David also lived the rest of his life with the consequences of this terrible sin. His family was a mess. He suffered. In fact, he died about 70 years old, which to me sounds pretty young, right? I mean, yeah, he was, he was a mess. And I think a part of it was because of the sin, other sins. It just weakened him and just problems in the family, strife. It was all a consequence of, sense of the sin. God forgive, forgave him, yes, but there were consequences. It's like the man, say, that comes to Christ. He's been involved in drug abuse or alcohol abuse all his life. His body is shot. God saves him. Hallelujah. He's a new man, new creature in Christ. But his body's a mess, right? He's suffering the consequences, the natural consequences of his sin. Something like that is what we see in David, all right? But God does call him, God does forgive him, and that gives us hope as well. God restored him to himself. And so this story teaches us about God's graciousness, but it also teaches us how to confess our sins to God. If we're going to get out of our fix in a, for, in a very clear, definitive way, we must come to confession. Look at this verse here. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. In other words, this is like a brokenness. He doesn't defend himself and say, well, wait, 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 the circumstances and what do I, I had a dysfunctional upbringing or whatever. No, no. He says, oh, I have sinned against the Lord. That's repentance, folks. Re realizing your real situation. That's why Nathan could say, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die because of true repentance. God forgave him, right? So, David faced his sin, confessed it to God. You know, the word confession means, it's, it's a Greek word, homologeo, which means to say the same thing. God says that sin is wrong. When I confess, I'm saying, yes, Lord, you're right. This is wrong. Okay? In true confession, it isn't just saying that, right? It's saying, yes, this is wrong. Woe be I. Hmm? Forgive me, God. That's, that's true confession. And that's what we see in the life of David. And that's why God, God, God um, forgives him. Notice this passage in Psalm 32. I think this is written probably after this situation with Bathsheba. But notice how David appreciates what God had done in his life, how he had forgiven him in, in such a wonderful way. Blessed, that means happy, to be envied. Okay? Blessed is the one whose transgression, whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered, ultimately by the blood of Christ, right? Ah, that's wonderful. He says, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, and you know, David kept quiet, kept quiet for a long time, months and months, about this whole thing with Bathsheba. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. If you're living in the flesh, covering up your sins, folks, you're not happy. You're not happy. People may not see it from the outside, but you are groaning in your inward self, right? For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Huh, heat of summer. Anybody felt heat recently? <laughs> right? We understand this very well. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will forgive my 
confessed my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. In non-corona times, I would say, all the people said, in your heart, amen. Good, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, folks, there's nothing more wonderful than confessing and being forgiven that brings joy in the Lord. And God loves you so much that he, he goes after you, pursues you, that you would confess your sin and get back on the blessing side of things. And that's what he did with David. In fact, David was so, so happy about this. This is verses 1, and five, 1 to 5. Look at verse 8 of the same psalm, Psalm 32. Verse, verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Some think that God is saying this. I think David is the one that's saying this in the context. He's saying, you know, I did foolish things, right? I'm going to help you not to do the same stupid thing. I want to instruct you in the right way that you would be blessed. You would have the joy of forgiveness. So he has part of his discipleship work now in David, right? Helping other people straighten out their lives and live for God, not experience loss. He says, you know, he wants people to make their confession Willingly, right? Willingly. Not because God has to apply pressure. Hmm. I knew a young lady years ago. Did some counseling with her. She came from a great Christian family. Her life was a mess. Is that possible? To come from a great Christian family and your life be a mess? Unfortunately, it happens often. Okay? In fact, her, her life was such a mess that she got into the worst of sins her sexual life was just horrible, drugs, alcohol. Um, in fact, she was so under the influence often, she had, to, she had uh, several accidents with her car, demolished the car totally, and lived to tell the story. It's incredible, right? God had mercy. Finally, because she would steal to pay for her habits, she was sent to prison. Young lady, young lady, sent to prison. And fortunately, in prison is where God got a hold of her heart. She had to go that far to listen to God. And God talked about restoration. She repented of her wrongdoing. She got her life right with the Lord. And I can tell you that today she's a vibrant Christian that is following the Lord. But nothing, of, none, nothing would have happened good if she, if she, had she not confessed her sins, been broken. Folks, to be broken... To come to that end of self and say, God, forgive me. I've done it wrong. That is such a blessing because that is a path to blessing, okay? If you say, well, Lord, do me a light. God says, shh. <laughs> come on, right? He says, oh, God, forgive me. I'm wrong. Have mercy on me. That's the path of blessing. If you want to come back to God, if you're far from Him, don't, don't piddle around the, you know, tip around the tulips, as they say, or just, or around whatever this is up here, right? Just come directly to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Humbly, I have no defense. I just simply come to you. And God will restore you. And so I can't emphasize enough the topic of confession. But, you know, going along with that is, is also walking with other believers, right? Often, again, a Nathan, having somebody help us understand or be willing to face the fact that we need to confess. I'm going to close with a verse on, on here up on the wall that I think is, gives us a balance in terms of um, how to act in a way that helps us to avoid these fixes, right, these, these predicaments. Very well-known verse. In fact, this is such a helpful verse. That it's, I'll help you I'll give you a tip to memorize it. Or do, do you remember the, the reference, the address, right? 2 Timothy 2.22. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Okay? You're probably smart enough for that, right? I think we are, right? All of us smart enough. 2, 2, 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2.22. 2, 2, and it says this. So flee youthful passions. It's not talking just about young people, but because passions are strongest in our youth, right? It says flee youth, strong passions. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So, first of all, it says flee. Let's put that in color. And flee means, you know what flee means? 
simply means to get out of there as quick as you can, right? David was walking along the roof, right? We don't know how it was possible for a woman to be bathing on the other side. She had her part as well. But he knew that somehow. He peeked and peeked again, right? If he was fleeing, what would he have done? Gone to the other side of the roof, right? <laughs> or gone downstairs or done any old thing. But if he would have gotten away from that temptation, flee, get away. If your phone is being a problem, leave it home. <gasps> yeah, your life, you won't die. Oh, well, maybe, but it's okay, you know. We flee, right, from what causes temptation. Then it says, and pursue. That's a strong word. To pursue means to give yourself to something, right? All, with all your might, I'm going to pursue what kind of a life? Righteous, righteous, faithful, and loving and peaceful life. In other words, I'm going to pursue the right stuff, okay? Was David pursuing the right stuff? No, he was thinking about his lusts and stuff and he deserved and his greatness and all this garbage that led to his disaster, his, his, his failure. So we're to pursue with all of our hearts these good things, but folks, we don't do it alone. Look at the last part. It says, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I'm always concerned when I see Christians who kind of think they can manage alone. They don't really have any close friends. They just show up at church, you know, like ghosts. They show up, ooh, bye-bye, ciao, choo-doo, they're gone. No. We're to be along with those. In other words, you know, here they are, right? We know them. They're in flesh with people of flesh and blood. We have contact. We're open to them. They tell us things. They talk to us. Hey, Amen. And they can tell us the truth. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This is what we need. Flee. Pursue. Along with. If you live that way, you will not get into a fix, or we say in English, to get into a pickle. <laughs> and German pickles something else, right? <laughs> but you'll not get into a pickle, but not into a fix. You will be able to pursue a life that is God-honoring, God-glorifying. And that's what I long for you today, my dear people. So let's not imitate David in the bad. Let's imitate David in the good, his repentance, and following him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Thank you for the practical nature of your word. Even talking about such heinous sins, we, 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 we can learn lessons, Father. We want to take these lessons today and, and, and not get caught in predicaments that are really against your will for us. We want to be sensitive. We want to flee from them. We want to pursue the right and allow Nathans to speak into our lives. So, Father, thank you that you will do this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am a friend of God. Oh, oh, oh. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me? Amen.